Hello and welcome to episode 373 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert, as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm in great spirits, Andy. The sun is shining. We've had some more great feedback from podcast listeners. So yeah, the, the world is good at the moment for me, Andy. I mean, you're going to read out one of the reviews that we've just had in, and it's particularly one of my favourite reviews that we've actually read out for quite some time. Well, let's read that now. Let's start on a positive note. So this was from Ben, and the title of the review is simply the best. And it's a slightly longer one, this, but it's worth reading out in full because, like you say, Damien, it touched not just you, but the rest of the team. Financial literacy has not always been my strongest point, but after listening to 371 episodes, my understanding of investing, personal personal finance and finance in general has increased substantially. Ben goes on to say, for clarity, I am 27 years old and whilst not all episodes may be completely relevant to me, what they do provide is sound evergreen bank of knowledge, which I can then refer back to should I stumble across a particular topic, which I would like more information on. Not only that, but I will get the information delivered clearly and concisely without the often unnecessary complicated jargon other podcasts and resources tend to use. I do not believe it is an overstatement to say that this podcast has changed my life in a significant way. I understand far better than my parents the power of personal finance and investing, something my parents never really considered. And with hopefully many more years ahead of me, I do believe that this knowledge could help me create generational wealth for my family going forward. Thank you, Damien and Andy and the rest of the team who often appear on the podcast for providing the soundtrack to my Sunday dog walks for several years now. If you're ever in my neck of the woods, I'd love to buy you a pint and say thanks. And that was from Ben, who is actually the proud owner of a Money to the Masses mug, who's obviously a keen listener. So Damien, as we said earlier, that gave us all a bit of a, a spring in our step when we got that review through. Yeah, what people have to realise when we do these podcasts are that me and Andy actually today are in separate locations because of logistics. Andy then edits them, gets them sounding as wonderful as he does get them to sound, and then they go out. And then that is as much interaction that we really get with people who listen to it. So all the thousands and thousands of people who listen to the show it's only when you then engage with us via social media or you email us or you send us reviews that we get that interaction with the audience so it's fantastic when you get somebody who says that something that you've made i.e this podcast has changed their life and when you give that to the team at money to the masses it has a massive impact because you have to realize that some members of the team have joined this journey much later than obviously i started it so they're used to a world where perhaps there is a lot more feedback directly with the public than what we have so it's brilliant it motivates everybody and i always share the reviews around the team so it gives everybody a, a real boost so on that note we have got another member of the team coming on again to the show today so laura will be on the show later actually i might as well just tell you what's on the show today so laura will be doing a piece regarding changes in mortgage rules relating to affordability testing that lenders have to carry out or did have to carry out, I've given you a hint as what the piece is going to be about. The rules have changed this week, so she's going to explain what that actually means now for consumers. I'm going to do a piece based on an email that I got in from a listener and an 8020 investor member that references what's going on in markets at the moment, so investment markets, and making decisions based upon that. And Andy, you're going to be doing a piece that is quite topical, but evergreen, because it relates to the chaos that we've been experiencing on the railway network. That's right. I looked into this earlier this week and did a short news story on it. And actually, after researching it, I really Realized there was more to this than initially meets the eye in terms of refunds and compensation. So I'll be covering that later on in the pod to answer a few of those niche nuanced questions that none of us really know, but you will know at the end of this pod. Yeah, so all about your consumer rights in that regard. And don't forget, unfortunately, we probably are going to have a summer of strikes, not just probably on the rails, but also on the tube and other networks. So I'll crack straight on with the investment piece that I'm doing this week. And I say an investment piece, but it's actually more broad than that. I actually received an email from a listener, and I'm going to paraphrase what they asked. And they started out the email by saying they recently cashed in an investment account they held somewhere else. 
because they weren't happy with the risk being taken in that particular investment that they had that was something that was a legacy investment I think they've had for years and years and years and they were deciding what they would now do with that money and they said they wanted to grow that money and they were pondering their options and obviously having listened to the podcast there are lots of options they could be doing and thinking about and they asked should they be using that money to add to their stocks and shares ISA now should they pay down their mortgage which is currently on a fixed low rate interest should they go into crypto or should they do something else entirely And the backdrop of this question relates to what's going on in investment markets, because they also said, with the world standing on its head at the moment, does the finance world expect normality to ensue so that we can just enjoy the roller coasters that we're seeing in investment markets at the moment, or is more at play? And he refers to two pieces I've done the podcast previously, one relating to how bonds and equities have started to behave differently than they have over the last decade. If you want to listen to that episode, it's episode so 366, which was the death of the equity bond portfolio. And he also mentions the fact that cryptocurrencies have been behaving differently. So that refers to podcast 368, where I did a piece on Bitcoin behavior changes. In short, Bitcoin now is highly correlated to technology stocks. So really, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies are a quasi bet on tech, but they've also got the other issues they've got going on in the background regarding some of the implosions that we're seeing in the crypto world. One of those being Luna, which I covered in podcast 369. So this question is actually a great way of me highlighting some of the recent pieces we've been doing that are relevant to today's market. So the email finished off by saying, obviously, they knew I couldn't give advice about exactly what they could do, but maybe it'd be a useful piece for the podcast. So there will be a lot of people listening to this podcast who would be interested to what I said to a question like that. So first of all, I'm going to give you another podcast to listen to. So with regards to overpaying your mortgage, go to podcast 219 because I talk about what to check before overpaying your mortgage in that episode. So you'll find out everything you need to know there with regard to whether you want to overpay your mortgage. But My suggestion to this person was to not to talk about the individual options, but to instead sit back, take their time and view the choices that they've got in isolation of what's going on in investment markets. So a lot of people at the moment, including the person who wrote this email, were making decisions based upon a backdrop of what's going on in bond and equity markets and even crypto markets. And at the time they sent this email, crypto markets hadn't quite imploded as much as they have now. And so my suggestion to ignore what's going on in markets is based upon the fact that we have a tendency to let FOMO, so that fear of missing out, or the fear of losing money dictate what we do, especially when markets are incredibly volatile. And so if you're in a similar position to this person where you're trying to decide what to do, then sit there and ask yourself the question, how would you react or what would your choices be or how would you view those choices differently if markets were rallying very, very strongly? So things were flying or how would you view each of those choices or your other options if markets were falling even harder and if your view based upon that hypothetical game changes then you know that you're allowing emotions to drive some of your decisions and the trouble is if you start to let emotions lead your decisions you tend to make poorer decisions and also what you're trying to do is market time so you're thinking well is now a good time to be in investment markets equity markets are falling bond markets are falling will they rally And so you're trying to time the market. And as we know, success in timing markets is largely down to luck more than judgment. So what you need to do is ignore what's going on in markets and then sit down and think about what is it you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve financial freedom? Are you trying to grow your wealth? Is the size of your mortgage, for example, starting to worry you? Do you need access to the money that you've just acquired? So when they encash that investment, do you need access to that in the short term? Or could you tie it up over the long run? What's your attitude to risk? Is the heightened volatility in markets actually making you nervous? And have you just realized you've been taking far too much risk with your investments by sitting down and viewing this logically and taking your time to do so? Because there is no rush to make this decision. You've got the money. There is no rush to say you've got to get into the market today tomorrow or even the day after and then if you think about it objectively seek financial advice if you need to as it could help you understand your options fully and then make a plan 
and then put that plan in place. So for example, that plan could be that you're going to decide to invest the money, but you are worried about markets tumbling. And so you diversify your portfolio, but you drip in over a period of time. I've talked about pound cost averaging before on the podcast, you could decide to put your money in over a space of a year in equal installments every month. And then if markets do slump, if that's what you're worried about, then you will benefit from pound cost averaging where you buy more of your investments at the cheaper rates when markets do hopefully and somewhat inevitably tend to rebound, then you will profit to a greater degree. And you know, I like analogies. And this person had just emailed me from holiday, funnily enough. And I said, look, you need to compare this to going on holiday. So when you go on holiday, you want to go away, you think about where you would like to go, you look at your various options, then you decide where it is you're going to go. And then you work backwards from that, how you're going to achieve that, how much is it going to cost? Can you afford it? Do you need to change your package? Can you afford it? Then once you've booked it, you then plan your journey and you execute it. So you might be planning how you're going to get to the airport. The thing is, you can always get stuck in traffic on the way to the airport or your plane can be cancelled. And this is kind of a nice segue to Andy's piece later in the podcast on strikes and delays. But you can't control those things. And if the anxiety of what could go wrong bothers you, then you would be better off just staycation or just staying at home in the garden rather than flying abroad. And that is the equivalent in the investing world of being in cash. There's nothing wrong with that. If that makes you feel better, if that's what you want, just because everybody else is going abroad doesn't mean that you have to as well. So think of investing a bit like that, that you plan what you want, your options and execute what makes you comfortable and what achieves your goals in the long run. And once you execute that plan, then you enjoy the turbulence as it comes along when you're on that plane. That could be when you invest, the stock market's going up and down because that is what happens. That is part of the journey. And if it's a long-term investment plan, then those periods of volatility shouldn't really bother you that much. Because I'll be honest with people, the recent market volatility obviously may be concerning to some people. But when I invest, I look at that and just think there's opportunity there, especially when you're investing regularly and dripping money in each month. You don't even need to look at the value of your portfolio because you're investing for the long term. And as I've said before, and it's worth bearing in mind, if you're investing for the very long term, let's say you've got another 10, 20 years maybe until you're going to access that money, then you're probably going to have another economic slump before you even get to the point at which you're going to retire, which will mean that this current one will pale into insignificance or largely be forgotten by then. So the message of this piece of the podcast is whatever choices you've got, make sure you view them in isolation in terms of your circumstances and what you're trying to achieve in terms of your goals and objectives, not based upon the volatility and the noise that's going on around you at that given time. Okay, good stuff. So let's welcome Laura back to the show then. And there's been quite a big change that's happened this week and it's hit the news regarding mortgages and lenders, specifically in relation to affordability rules. So this first came onto the radar back in December when the Bank of England announced that it was consulting on the affordability assessments that mortgage lenders were using. What they were considering doing and what has now actually come to pass is they wanted to scrap the stress testing element of that application process. So what used to happen was that potential borrowers would have to pass certain affordability criteria in order to qualify qualify for a particular size loan. So this included four main points. The first is the existing financial commitments they've got and the overall level of indebtedness that they've got. The second is the number of financial dependents they've got, i.e. the the number of children they've got. And then there's the day-to-day living expenses and how much disposable income they've got, how much they're paying on bills and just day-to-day living costs. The final part of it, and this is the part that's changing, is a stress test that looked at if the loan would still be affordable if interest rates rose by 3%. And it's that part that they've now decided to do away with. They're keeping the other parts in place. And the point is that they believe that those other three criteria are enough to make sure that these loans are sensible or affordable. And that combined with keeping income multiples at around the four and a half times people's salary is enough to kind of keep a lid on these loan amounts to keep it sensible and to try and avoid us going back
back to a kind of financial crisis situation where a lot of these mortgages were simply getting out of control. So, Laura, it was interesting because the headlines, therefore, were shouting about affordability testing and it being a change, almost giving the impression that suddenly things were going to be a lot easier for borrowers. In reality, based on what you've said in the insight, because you spent a lot of time looking at the rules, is that their stress test is going to therefore disappear, which in one way is a positive for people who are borrowing because that one test is going to be removed. But it does mean that if people are thinking that that opens the door to being able to borrow lots more money, in reality, lenders are being limited to the number of mortgages they can issue with those like four and a half, five time income multiples. So the market isn't going to be suddenly flooded with all these high income multiple deals. There are still going to be some sensible checks. And the idea is that this just makes it a bit easier for lenders, isn't it? That there's these existing rules that will keep the mortgage market in check. That's the hope anyway, and make it simpler for lenders without them having to do this extra check. So would you say it's obviously a positive for people who are thinking and they're trying to get a mortgage or remortgage in the future. It's certainly one less check that's going to be placed upon them. Yes. So the reason the Bank of England started this consultation process in the first place is because they estimated that around 50,000 renters weren't able to get a mortgage because of this stress testing element and that a lot of other borrowers were having to borrow a lot less than they otherwise would have been able to. So that was the kind of catalyst for doing it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. While it's going to make the process a little bit easier, it might help some people onto the ladder who otherwise might not have been able to. It's not going to be a major change. It's not going to be a free for all. We're not going to go back to those kind of 120% LTV mortgages and real high levels of loans to income. Those days, I think, are still well behind us. Uh, What I would say, though, is timing wise, it seems slightly crazy and counterintuitive, because when this rule was introduced in 2014, from then until now, mortgage rates have been very low, very stable. And it's really only been in the last six months since this consultation, the interest rates are suddenly going up very quickly and there is the potential that they could actually go up further. So it does seem a bit counterintuitive that now's the point that they're removing this interest rate check that perhaps is more relevant now than it ever has been. So yeah, slightly strange timing. They couldn't really have anticipated the levels of inflation and the increase in interest rates that we're now seeing. But yeah, overall, We're going to see some changes to the affordability, but it's not going to be a major upheaval of it. But one thing when I was reading around the the topic, they seem to believe that the other rules that are in place about responsible lending should ensure that the financial system remains robust and that the mortgage market can endure any interest rate rises like you've mentioned. So we will have to wait and see on that. But I suppose for people out there, if you keep paying your mortgage, you maintain those payments, you don't fall behind behind, then this is something that could overall be a positive for people out there. And certainly a bit of good news, obviously, in a world where we're seeing mortgage rates go up rapidly, and the best mortgage rates being pulled all the time in light of the fact, like you said, Laura, that the Bank of England could continue to raise the base rate going forward. Not to be the kind of voice of doom, but I think um, in terms of affordability, the main problem that people are going to face, not so much this stress testing element, but meeting the day-to-day living expenses requirement. Because with the cost of living crisis, I think people are going to struggle to secure the size of loan that they may want to because their outgoings are increasing significantly. You know, with inflation kind of edging around the 10% mark, I think that's going to be a bigger issue, a bigger struggle for people rather than this stress testing element. And just to add an an interesting point that I saw was looking at what's happening to mortgage rates, looking at a Halifax mortgage from last August, a 60% LTV two-year fixed was available at 0.83%. Fast forward to today, that same deal has gone up to 2.62%. So there's still challenges there. It's still not an easy picture for either borrowers or mortgage lenders at the moment. But 
hopefully perhaps the stress testing element will alleviate some of that pain. I know there'll be people worrying about when they come off their fixed deals. And we've done a couple of pieces in the last few podcasts that have covered this angle because we're getting a lot of emails and contact from people out there worrying about mortgages. And actually, when we look at the traffic that we're getting on the site at the moment, a lot of it is based around people worrying about interest rates and mortgages. One other thing to bear in mind, if you're not trying to borrow more money, then you have got more options, of course, as well, because of the things that we talked about in the previous episodes, like product transfers with your existing lender is one such option. So if you're not trying to borrow more money, then things will be a bit easier for you than if you are going to try and borrow even more, whether it's to move or improve your existing property or something like that. So Nora, thank you for coming on as ever. Now, Andy, we're now moving on to your piece regarding travel disruption and what consumers' rights are in terms of compensation and refunds. Yeah, so you won't have escaped the news this week in terms of the strikes that are happening right across the country with pretty much every train operator being a part of these strikes. And it's meant that service disruption is huge. Over 50% of the network has been affected and it's meant a reduction of around 80% in terms of the services that are being offered to travellers over a number of days that's happened this week. And as Damien alluded to earlier, there are talks of more strikes coming up in the coming week. So I did a little bit of digging in terms of what people can do if they've been affected by this. So let's start right at the top. What can you do if the train that you're intending on traveling has been cancelled or is likely to be cancelled? So that's key wording there is likely to be cancelled because of course you may not know ahead of time whether your train is going to arrive or not because of this ongoing service disruption. So for the specific week of the strikes, the week that's just gone, you can actually use your ticket on another day up until the 28th of June. Now, this podcast goes out on the 26th of June, so you've got until Tuesday. Of course, you may well be listening to this podcast after that date, in which case, ignore that particular piece of information. Now, single-use tickets for strike delays can actually be used the day before a strike. Again, that's probably already been. But think about this in the coming months. If a strike is coming up, you can use your pre-booked single use ticket the day before you travel if you think you're going to be impacted. And you can, again, they'll announce it nearer the time, but you can use your ticket after the travel day up to a few days after. And again, the details will be announced about future strikes as to what dates those are. So just keep in mind, if you're thinking about traveling in the future and you're worried about strikes, you can use your ticket likely one day before and a little bit after you're due to travel. So there is a bit of flexibility there. If you want to swap your single use ticket that you've booked for an alternative date, you can check with a rail company who you purchased it through and you will likely be able to change the date of that ticket with no questions asked and no fees to pay. The reason I'm saying the word single use tickets is there are other types of tickets which are of course multiple use tickets and more often referred to as season tickets we'll cover those in detail a little bit later on so i'm talking about single trips that you've booked in advance specifically in this part of the pod so that's the first thing you can do or and this is what i really liked about this if you know that your train is cancelled or is likely to be cancelled as a result of a strike you can get a full refund and this includes any ticket type, again, single use ticket. So that'll be advanced tickets, standard, first class, everything is included in terms of what you can get a refund for. So you just need to go back to who you put the ticket through. And we supply links in an article, which we'll put in the show notes where you can get refunds if you've been affected by that. And just to reiterate, I'll read out what online rail platform, the train line has stated on their website. It simply says, if you've booked with us and your train has been cancelled or rescheduled, you're entitled to a fee free refund if you choose not to travel or you can rearrange your trip without a fee. So it's fairly simple there, black and white. If you're affected, you get a refund or you can travel at a different time. Next, we're moving on to compensation if you've experienced delays as a result of the strike. So this is where you intended to travel, the strikes have happened, and as a result of that, you've been delayed. Now, again, we're covering single-use tickets here. It doesn't matter whether the ticket you've purchased is an advanced ticket, off-peak ticket, anytime ticket, you will be entitled to either a full or partial refund so long as your journey has been impacted 
and you've been delayed by 15 minutes or more. I'll explain what that means in in real details in just a second. The reason why it's a little bit woolly there is every train operator runs a slightly different compensation scheme. And the system most operators use is a system called delay repay, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of now. And a delay repay compensation system is where the train operator will pay compensation to you in, in the form of a refund, either part or full, whether that delay was there for or not. So it does vary from company to company and you can go onto the National Rail website and find your train operator who you've booked through to see what their policy is. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. But just for the pod, I looked at about 10 different rail operators and their compensation policy via delay replay was very, very similar. So I'll just summarize it. If you've been delayed between 15 and 29 minutes, you'll generally get around 25% of your ticket back in the form of a refund. If your journey has been delayed by 30 minutes to an hour, you'll get 50% of your ticket back in the form of a refund. If it's a return ticket, you'll get half of that. So if it was a single, you get 50% of it back. If it was a return, you would actually get 25% off of the full return. Hopefully that makes sense. If you've been delayed by between one and two hours, you'll get 100% back off your single ticket. Again, if it's a return ticket, you'll get 50% off the total value of your return. And if you've been delayed for more than two hours, you'll likely get 100% of your full ticket back, whether it's a single or a return. So if you think about the service disruption that's happened, there's going to be a lot of people that have been delayed by a significant amount of time. And many people would have been delayed at least an hour, if not two. And so lots of those people will be entitled to potential full refunds. So make sure you go on to our article, which we'll put in the details, and you can click on the how to get a refund section, and we'll explain exactly how to do that. Now, I mentioned season ticket compensation earlier. This is slightly more complex. I won't go into a huge amount of detail on the podcast. Essentially, it's slightly different because the way that you pay for a season ticket, you get a discount for taking multiple trips. And so the way that they work out what your refund is, is based on how they cost the season ticket. Put simply, if you've got a one week season ticket, it's effectively 10 single journeys. If you've got a monthly ticket, it's based on 40 single journeys. If you've got an annual ticket, it's based on 464 journeys. You can still do the delay repay and it's based on the same parameters that I explained earlier about the 15 minutes up to two hours delays roughly. Again, it depends which rail operator you are, but if you use those as your general rule, it will then be divided by the number of journeys on that ticket. So to keep things simple, if you've booked a one week, seven day season ticket, that equates to 10 single journeys. So if you paid £100 for that, each journey is worth £10. If you've been delayed between 15 minutes and 30 minutes, you get a 25% refund on one single journey, which is £10 of your 100. You'll get £2.50 back. Hopefully that makes sense. Next, I'm going to cover a section which actually got me a bit excited. I'm sad (laughs) of that. (laughs) Right. Okay, carry on then. (laughs) This particular area I didn't think was possible. So this is kind of my key takeaway for people who are listening to the pod. I'm someone who hates delays and I will often uh, shy away from traveling if there's any sorts of delays. And I didn't realize you can actually get compensation for this. So what if you're in a situation where you know strikes are happening and you decide not to travel? Well, in theory, this is really simple. If your train is delayed or cancelled and then you decide not to travel, then you're entitled to a full refund. Again, this doesn't apply to season tickets. This is single trip tickets only. But what is really interesting is that this is the case even if your train is only delayed by a couple of minutes. So you could get to the station, you can look at the train board and see that every train is delayed by five, 10 minutes. And you just think, do you know what? It's too hot today. I'll do it on another day. I can't be bothered with these delays. You're actually entitled to a full refund in that situation because 30.1, and this is how sad I am, of the National Rail Conditions of Travel states that if the train you intend to use is cancelled, delayed, or your reservation will not be honoured, and therefore you decide not to travel, you may return the unused ticket to the original retailer or train company from whom it was purchased, where you'll be given a full refund with no administration fee being charged. To get a refund for your unused ticket, you can head to the ticket office, call the train company or fill out a form online. 
And if you booked your tickets on a third party website, then you'll need to send the tickets back to that company who issued them. And you usually have 28 days to submit this claim. And in the form of sending it off and doing it online, it could take up to 28 days for that to be processed. But if you booked it through your rail operator, you can actually go to the ticket office on the platform and actually hand the ticket back to them and get a full refund. That's what I found really interesting because I've been in this situation a number of times where I've decided, you know what, not today. I'm looking at that, looking at the delays. I don't fancy it. And I've assumed that I'd have to write off that because I paid for the ticket in advance, etc. But no, make sure you get your refund if you don't travel. You're fully entitled to, so long as there are delays. Next, we'll move on to exchanging your tickets. Now, there's an interesting point here to note that the rail industry made an amendment to the terms and conditions of advanced ticket And this was in an effort to gain confidence and get people traveling by rail again after the pandemic because they suffered a significant fall in footfall. So between the 21st of June 2021 and running up to the 30th of September this year, 2022, advanced tickets can be exchanged so that you can travel on the same journey, but at a different time or date completely fee free. Now that's a big change to the previous rules in which there was quite severe penalties if you tried to change or amend your advanced tickets. They can also be surrendered back to the retailer where you won't get a full refund in terms of money back to you. You will get a rail travel voucher for the full value, which can be used on any future journey that you purchase within 12 months of that voucher being issued. You may have to pay the difference if the fare for the new date or time is more expensive. And similarly, you'll be issued with a rail voucher if the new journey is cheaper. If you decide to exchange your advanced ticket, it must be done no later than 6 p.m. the day before you're due to travel. However, you can do it right up until the minute before your train is due to leave, but there will be a fee in that situation. So if you do it before 6 p.m. the night before you're due to travel, you'll effectively get a full refund through a voucher, which you'll need to use, or you can just change the date and time and you might have to pay the difference. I decided then to look up what these fees are because that last example there, I said you may have to pay a fee. What are the fees that you have to pay? I was quite shocked here. I'll give you an example here with the train line. If you have to pay a fee. So let's use the example. You've got an advance ticket. You don't change it the day before you're due to travel and you exchange it on the day. That is subject to a fee. Well, if your ticket is £13, the fee you'll have to pay on that is £8.50. I mean, that's huge. That's more than 50% of your refund. That is a ripoff. Yeah, absolutely. It's a ripoff. So if you have got an advance ticket up until the 30th of September, if you realise that you can't travel, just make sure you change it by 6pm the day before and you won't be charged a fee for changing the dates on that ticket. What I am pleased to report in terms of the fees though, they are capped at £10. So if you've got a really expensive ticket, so you you know you're traveling the distance of the UK, it's over £150. Maximum fee on that is £10. Not too bad in that regard. It's still a ripoff, don't get me wrong. Okay, so I think I've covered quite a lot there. There's quite a lot of information to take in. Let's finish off with something sorry it's a bit London based, but this is in regard to tube strike action and whether you can get money back on your tube tickets. Well the simple answer is no you can't not in regard to strike action. And it's a bit of a shame this, and it's where this whole system of refunds and compensation falls through the cracks because people who have season tickets where they travel into London, it includes the tube often on those journeys. And if the whole tube network is down and not running, surely you're entitled to some sort of refund. Well, in terms of strikes, you're not, but you can get money back in the same way that you can do the delay repay through the rail network. Similar thing applies to the tube network. So tube strikes aside, you can receive compensation on the London Underground network if your journey has been delayed by more than 15 minutes. Really similar to the delay repay system on the rail network, the tube network runs a service delay refund service in which you can go online and get a refund if you've been delayed more than 15 minutes. I won't go into detail how you do that. But what is quite interesting about this is that the money you get back is the value of a single pay-as-you-go fare for your journey at the time that you've travelled. And it includes journeys made using the underground, overground and the Docklands Light Railway. If you end up getting off before you intended, the refund will be based on where you touched in and touched out. 
just to reiterate, that's the full pay-as-you-go refund, and that applies even if you didn't pay the full rate. So, for example, if you made the journey as part of your weekly or monthly travel card, you'll still get the full pay-as-you-go single fare back. So keep that in mind. If you are someone who's paying an extortionate amount for your season ticket each year, for every time that you're delayed 15 minutes or more, keep a note of it and make sure you do that refund request. Again, make sure you do it within 28 days to ensure that you get that refund paid back to you. But it's money that you're entitled to. It's compensation for poor service and you should take advantage. So Andy, I have to say, I could sit here and just applaud because I thought that was a brilliant piece. I was almost in stunned silence because I didn't know the full content of that piece that Andy was going to do and the passion that I've discovered that Andy clearly has for railways and perhaps it shouldn't have been surprising because this is the man who did write a best-selling book on the train didn't you Andy yeah it was a four-part series it was titled as they slept the whole idea was basically trying to prove what people could do while other people slept I hate wasting time all the people sleeping yeah and so Andy did go to number one on the Amazon book charts and even appeared on Australian breakfast TV about the whole thing because it obviously went viral this was quite some time ago anyway Andy that was a fantastic piece like you say a lot of content in there we will link to the article that Andy's also written alongside that piece in the show notes and of course on the post on the main to message website that relates to this episode which is episode 373 so that is it for this week Andy we're done as ever please do leave a review you've heard how much it meant to me and Andy when you leave glowing reviews and how much the team value them also don't forget to follow us on our social channels instagram tiktok twitter i mean obviously i'm a particular fan of instagram right now you see me on there almost daily doing stuff on stories and it's also a great way to be directed to past episodes because on there i'm regularly pointing people to particular parts of past episodes that they can click on and jump in and listen to so if you're a podcast fan then you should be really following us on instagram so you can take advantage of that and of course join our facebook community group so go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses and there are over 4,000 people in that group at the moment so it'd be great to have you in there because there's a real positive vibe in that community and people answering questions and helping each other so do join in so all that's left for me to do Andy is to say until next time until next time whoa, whoa.